Okay, well, thank you very much for inviting me to uh, this symposium. I'm going to talk about augmenting the fixation of implants using stem cells. And um, I'm from University College London, but I'm based at the Royal National Orthopaedic Hospital, which is about 10 miles north of central London. And in this hospital, we are a specialist centre for the treatment of bone cancers. And that treatment involves resection of the bone cancer and replacement with a massive prosthesis. This, for example, if I can... Oh, there's no point. This is a... In the centre is a distal femur uh, where there's a shaft which replaces over half of the femur and a stem which is fixed into the remaining part of the proximal femur and that articulates with a, a, a hinged knee joint. And on the far uh, uh, right-hand side you can see a patient who is very young that we treat uh, with a distal femur with a growing prosthesis. And large numbers of patients with bone cancers are, 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 are adolescent. And uh, that's a particular problem. Because when you look at the survivorship of these patients, of these prostheses in these patients, you will see that it's not that great. This is data taken from the 1990s. And you can see for the red line, which is for a distal femoral prosthesis, the survivorship at 10 years is around 68%. Now, if you are a young patient, you will be faced with multiple revision operations because revision operations are nowhere near as successful as primary operations, and the primary operations themselves only have a 68% success rate. So uh, the problem with these prostheses is loosening, and this is seen on radiographs by the de development of a radiolucent line, which you see at the shoulder of the prosthesis, and this then moves down the implant fixation, unzipping the uh, bone from the surrounding implant. And this happens very regularly and very quickly. However, at the same time, you also see a piece of bone which forms over the transection site. We call this reactive bone. But this bone isn't actually doing anything. It's separated from the surface of the implant by a thick layer of fibrous tissue. And that thick layer of fibrous tissue um, travels along the stem implant interface as well. So one of the things we did when I first arrived was we tried to make use of that piece of bone by applying a layer of porous material adjacent to the transection site. We call this a collar. And we are relying on what's called uh, bony bridging to actually grow into the porous structure and stabilise the fixation. However, uh, in 30 cases that we did, none of them worked. We got lots of bone produced adjacent to the transaction site, but there was very little integration, very little osseointegration, very little integration of the bone with the surrounding prosthesis. So in the mid-1990s, we thought again, and we changed that uh, collar to a groove structure which was coated with a layer of hydroxyapatite. And hydroxyapatite is bone mineral which you can produce uh, in the la laboratory and you can apply it using a plasma sprayed technique onto the surface of the implant. And lo and behold, that has worked in the majority of cases. And here you can see... Some examples, this is uh, remodelling of the uh, bone which is integrated with the prosthesis at the shoulder. And also when we look at a number of autopsy retrieved specimens, we see uh, integration of that bone with a thin layer of hydroxyapatite, which we see here. Uh, and this is a single one millimetre groove. The pink material is the bone. And we think this has various benefits. So, for example, this case is a case of a, a patient that had an implant that was inserted at the age of seven. And this radiograph is taken when the patient was 19 years. And um, bone grows as the patient grows and moves away from the intermodullary stem. It remodels. But what we think happens in these cases is that the fixation of the central stem is protected by this new bone formation which occurs at the shoulder of the implant. 
Where this does not occur, you often see failure, you often see loosening, or on the uh, right-hand side, you can see fracture of the stem. That's because there are high stresses in this region. And so this is just a ma mathematical model, a finite element analysis, which shows that where you don't see any integration, you see high stresses on the stem, and that's uh, depicted by the grey colour. And where you do see integration, the stresses are dispersed, which means the st stem is protected and the bone fixation, the forces travelling al along the implant, are reduced. However, it doesn't work in every case, and this is a group of match patients where we've looked at the development of radiolucent lines um, in implants that uh, were, had osseointegration and implants that didn't have osseointegration of the collar. And you can see the blue bars are the ones for the implants that did have osseointegration, and you can see the formation of radiolucent lines around the stem is small, and is non-progressive. The, the formation of radiolucent lines around the uh, stem without any osseointegration uh, increases over time and is higher. And this translates into survivorship of these implants because if you look at the survivorship of these implants at 10 years, you find that where you see an implant that is osseointegrated, the survival is 98%. Where you don't see an implant that is osseointegrated, where there is no osseointegration, the survivorship is around 75%. So it doesn't work in every case. And the question that we wanted to ad address was whether marrow-derived mesenchymal stem cells were able to facilitate bone regeneration in patients adjacent to massive prosthesis, in implants adjacent to massive prosthesis. We uh, sorted those uh, bone marrow stromal stem cells with STRO1. We showed all the usual features, tri-differentiation, calcification after about 20 days in culture, um, gene expression uh, for CBFA1, and uh, we then used a, 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 an animal model to demonstrate the effectiveness of these uh, uh, bone marrow-derived stem cells. Our overall aim was to develop a system that could be induced to engineer bone and bone formation adjacent to implants that would enhance fixation. And it should be remembered that in patients with bone tumours uh, who receive chemotherapy, this has a, a great effect on improving the survival rates in these patients. However, chemotherapy agents are known to inhibit bone formation and turnover. And the way that we did this was we incorporated mesenchymal stem cells into the thrombin component of fibrin glue, and then we mixed this with fibrinogen, and that glue sets on the surface of an implant in about two minutes. Uh, to do this, we first checked whether those cells were viable in fibrin glue. This was an in vitro study, and we looked at... Uh, uh, cell metabolic activity using Alamar Blue, and we looked at thymidine incorporation for, for proliferation, and we showed there was no difference over about 96 hours. We also showed that cells could divide, see, we could also see cells dividing in the fibrin glue. We then used uh, initially a rat bone defect model. This had a three millimeter gap, and this uh, was stabilized by an external fixator. In this experiment, we used 36 rats, half of which received chemotherapy. There were essentially three groups. One had a three millimeter defect, which was empty. One had a three millimeter defect, uh, which was filled with fibrin glue, uh, glue only. And one had a three millimeter defect, uh, which was filled with fibrin glue and cells. And it worked. You can see that uh, um, the chemotherapy groups marked C, for the control and the fibrin alone showed depressed bone formation. But when you gave uh, mesenchymal stem cells to these animals in fibrin glue, you saw an increase in bone formation over and above that associated with normal control bone formation. So we believe that uh, fibrin glue was a suitable material for the delivery of MSCs. Uh, the cells remained viable for a, a period of time. Um, 
and we wanted to see whether this uh, could significantly increase bone formation uh, in a more realistic model. Um, the, the reason for that is that we wanted to spray stem cells onto the surface of the HA collar um, to enhance extracortical bone bridging. Um, we still use fibrin glue, but this time we used a spray technique where we sprayed the stem cells in fibrin glue onto the surface of the implant. And again, we checked whether these cells, after spraying, were viable using uh, proliferation assays. And they seemed to be viable within the fibrin glue. Uh, this time we used uh, an ovine model, and this was a mid-shaft model with two HA-coated collars. And we used uh, 12 animals, half of which had a mesenchymal stem cell spray. Um, the defect was five uh, centimetres uh, in the mid-shaft of the tibia, and you can see a radiograph with the implant in place. And you can see the gloopy nature of the fibrin glue on the HA collar in the top right. Uh, if you looked at the radiographs over a six-month period, you saw a significant difference in the amount of bone formation adjacent to the HA collar. This was significant as early as two months. And this also uh, was translated into results associated with the amount of bone as analysed by uh, histology. Uh, in addition, not only did we see more bone formation, but importantly, we saw mo more bone contact, more osseointegration onto the surface of the implant. However, there is a problem, and the problem is that uh, where we're treating patients with bone cancers, uh, we cannot use autologous cells because of the risk of neoplasia, neoplasia. And therefore, we looked at the use of using allergenic cells. We knew these cells uh, were um, allergenic because we did some LM MLR assays between sheep. And in this, we used several groups uh, of different uh, numbers of stem cells. Uh, these stem cells in some of the groups were also... Uh, differentiated down the osteogenic lineage, and we used a group which had 10 million allergenic stem cells. And the stem cell application worked as long as it wasn't allergenic. The allergenic cells did not work at all. Uh, and so we are now uh, in search of a decent uh, donor allergenic cell. So if anybody has any ideas, I'll be pleased to hear them because this is very important. We're currently in a clinical trial using uh, autogenic mesenchymal stem cells, but on patients that don't have bone cancers. We also asked whether this could be used uh, for hip replacements. And in the UK, the number of hip replacements that are inserted every year is over 70,000. So it's a big, big market. And we simply sprayed the surface of the acetabular cup with a mesenchymal stem cell spray and uh, left this in a, a goat animal model for about uh, 12 weeks. And here you can see the implant. This thing is the head of the femur, the metal head of the femur, and the white thing is the acetabular cup made of polyethylene. This was backed with a layer of hydroxyapatite and titanium. What we did was we scored the amount of bone and fibrous tissue in radial lines uh, along the acetabular cup interface uh, from the central center of the femoral head. And essentially, we saw that the mesenchymal stem cells worked uh, on the periphery of the cup. There's less fibrous, there was less fibrous tissue seen on the periphery of the cup um, than with control groups. And indeed, the bone implant contact was significantly improved in this region when we used uh, bone mesenchymal stem cells. Um, however, there is a group of patients where we think that this wouldn't be applicable. And these are patients that come to clinic for revision proce procedures. And this is because in revision proce procedures, the uh, amount of bone that has been removed, so-called osteolysis, is much greater and there is a problem. 
about 10% of the uh, pro procedures in the UK per year are for re revision applications. And the revisions uh, and the performance of the revisions are inferior to primary hip replacements. And the reason for that is due to bone stock loss. So there needs to be something to enhance bone stock. And surgeons use um, an exacting technique which is called impaction allografting. And impaction allografting involves removing the loose acetabular cuff, filling the cavity with allograft bone chips, and then impacting those bone chips um, quite heavily, quite rigorously onto the surface of the bone to form a new cavity and then inserting a, a, a new cup and over time the surgeon hopes that the allograft remodels forming new bone. We wanted to enhance this remodeling by incorporating mesenchymal stem cells into the morselized allograft. First, we needed to look to see whether the stem cells that we incorporated could survive the rigorous impaction techniques. And to do this, being a bioengineer, we instrumented uh, a hammer which the surgeon used to impact the allograft. And this shows just one impaction and a series of, impaction, series of impactions from one, one operation. And you can see the impactions in the operation, which are very many, uh, often go over 20 kilonewtons. And if you think that when an average person walks, when, he actually, when the heel strikes the ground, he applies a force of only 2.3 kilonewtons, these forces are very high. So we wanted to just check that these cells, these stem cells, were able to survive this uh, impaction. So what we did was we sus suspension seeded cells onto allograft, we grew this allograft up over a four-day period uh, and we analysed the proliferation of these cells and then we impacted this allograft and then uh, subsequently analysed the proliferation of these cells after impaction. And impaction does have an effect. So 9 kilonewton, for example, the cells never seem to recover. But at 6 kilonewtons, these cells did seem to recover. <coughs> And so we uh, were kind of heartened by this and we used a 3 kilonewton impaction to look at the effects of impacted MSCs in an ectopic model of osseoinductivity. And we used various types of graft. We used 50-50 uh, graft with hydroxyapatite granules. We used pure allograft and we saw block MSCs. And in all cases... Where we used MSCs, there was over an under 100% increase in impaction. We then carried out a, an animal model. Uh, we mixed the clot, we mixed the, the chips and the cells with plasma to form a clot. We impacted that onto the walls of the bone and inserted a femoral stem. And these are the results. T0 represents the picture uh, with, with, with the impaction allograft. Uh, immediately after surgery. Uh, T6, months control, is the graft without any cells, and T6 months with the MSCs uh, shows that there is a lot more bone formation around the implanted uh, prosthesis. And again, the data shows both greater bone formation and also greater bone contact where you use mesenchymal stem cells. So in conclusion, mesenchymal stem cells may be used to Im enhance implant fixation. Um, we've developed a system where we can spray these in fibrine glue and uh, we hope to be able to use these cells in cancer patients to improve the survival of these massive implants. But there is an issue and the issue is that we need to use a source of allergenic cells um, in addition, in, uh, um, in hip replacements, we may be able to use autogenic cells and also in um, revision situations where there is bone stock loss, we can combine these cells with autograft for impaction 
and this also has a beneficial effect. So I'd just like to thank my co-workers, uh, the surgeons from the Royal National Orthopaedic uh, Hospital and the funding bodies. Thank you very much.